Hi, I'm Matt Spurlock with Norian Corporation. I'm here today to talk to you about elemental analysis. Elemental analysis is the most fundamental test used in oil analysis today. Its history goes all the way back to the 1940s and 50s when elemental analysis was first used to monitor wear generation in locomotive engines. However, as time has progressed, we found out that there's much more to elemental analysis than just looking at the presence of iron, copper, and lead. Today's elemental analysis reports will give us information related to somewhere between 15 and 25 different elements that are related to both wear metals, contaminant metals, as well as oil additives. The way elemental analysis works is through the principle of atomic emission spectroscopy, or AES. Through this process, individual atoms within the samples are excited using some type of high energy source. We're going to talk about two of those types today. The atoms absorb the energy from the excitation source and then are transformed into high energy uh, electronic states. Now, according to the laws of quantum physics, the atoms don't like being in the state, so they, they rapidly lose that energy, and the way they do that is by emitting light. Now, measuring the amount of the light that is emitted uh, at a particular emission wavelength for these atoms, uh, such as iron, copper, zinc, uh, uh, this concentration of each atom can be determined based on the amount of light that is, is set off. Now, one of the drawbacks behind atomic emission spectroscopy is size limitations. The uh, probability that a particle can be, be vaporized and analyzed using AES drops rapidly if those particles or uh, a, a large group of particles is above five microns in size. Most of these instruments are completely blind to anything above 10 microns in size. So what that tells us is that we can't completely rely on elemental analysis uh, to give us a true indication of uh, overall machine condition. Now, what can we expect to see with elemental analysis? Well, this is where we get our parts per million values. Okay, the unit of measure is in parts per million. Well, what is a parts per million? Well, it's basically one part of iron in a million parts of oil or one milligram per, per kilogram, or one ounce of iron in 6,500 gallons of oil. That equates to one part per million. Now, when we have that data, uh, ideally, the, the best way to establish alarms on this data is by uh, uh, getting some larger data set. Once we have that data set, then we can establish a trend. So we're looking at trend analysis is the best way to evaluate information gathered through elemental analysis. For wear debris, we're going to look at statistical data or statistical alarms, or we're going to look at rate of change alarms, how much debris has been generated over a given amount of time. Other types of alarms that we're going to do for things like contaminant metals or additive metals is a baseline comparison. So we want to run elemental analysis on our new oil as well as our used oil and make that comparison for contaminant metals and additive metals. Now, the way that atomic emission spectroscopy works uh, is, is really, uh, 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 really fairly easy. Our used oil analysis labs today, for the most part, use one of two types of instruments, either the ICP or the Rotrode. The ICP stands for inductively coupled plasma. Rotrode is rotating disc spectroscopy or arc spark emissions. Now the main difference between these two different methods really is just how the oil sample is vaporized. The ICP sample is vaporized in an argon plasma causing it exciting other particles that then result in that light emission. With rotating disc or rotrode spectroscopy, that sample is picked up on a carbon disc and passes, passes underneath an electrode where a, a high energy spark or a high voltage spark uh, uh, contacts that oil, vaporizing the oil, again, exciting the particles, causing the particles to emit light. That's really where the differences uh, uh, stop. From there, that light goes into the optic section of the machine. 
The optics on both types of the mach these machines, while have minor differences, for the most part function the same way. Those uh, uh, beams of light, or that light that is emitted off of the particles in the vaporization process, pass through a diffraction grid. That diffraction grid really acts like a prism. So what it's doing is it's separating the, the light by, by color or, or wavelength, if you will. And then photodiodes within the light or within the optics itself uh, measures the intensity of that light and is able to uh, transpose that intensity into a parts per million. Now the accuracy of these machines are both very, very good, provided that the calibration standard is in fact up to date. Now both of these machines do have size limitations as I mentioned earlier. The ICP or the plasma has a, a lower detection level than the Rotrode. ICP is very accurate, one to three microns in size, begins losing its accuracy up to about five microns in size, and beyond that is really uh, pretty much blind. The Rotrode spectroscopy, however, is accurate up to about eight microns in size, loses its accuracy between eight and 10 microns, and that is completely blind above 10 microns in size. So that means that we really cannot compare data uh, between a laboratory that is doing ICP with a laboratory that is doing rotating disc spectroscopy. If you would like more information about elemental analysis, wear debris analysis, or any other oil analysis test, please feel free to look into any one of Noria's oil analysis training seminars. You can find more information at noria.com. Thanks for watching.